So, hi. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's my first time in Uruguay. Uh, super excited to give this keynote. Thank you so much to the conference team and the organizers. I'm really happy to, happy to see that the Uruguay community is uh, going strong. Um, first things first, let's appreciate this beautiful drawing of a brain, which I did and took 80% of my time doing the slides <laughs> because it moves. Yes, 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 this is what we're here for, so. <laughs> um, okay, so this keynote is a story and I hope, you, I hope to uh, give you perspective on uh, Elixir that maybe you didn't have and um, it's also kind of a love letter to this language uh, and to how much things in this language make sense to me. Um, I won't really show you any code, there's been a lot of code today so I hope that's, that's okay. Uh, it's not really a technical talk um, but let me introduce myself first. So uh, I'm Andrea, um, I have a website that you can visit and uh, you can follow me. Uh, I have a book that you can buy, Testing Elixir, uh, that I wrote with uh, uh, Jeffrey Mathias and um, you can follow me on Twitter. Be sure to follow me like in the next few days because it's burning down so you know at least <laughs> Like, I, I don't think it's gonna make it for like a week, uh, so, you know, appreciate it. Um, I, I was born in Italy, uh, in, in that part of Italy, um, and I live in Italy now, which is uh, very far away, but uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, one thing that I love about Italy is that we're very passionate about food. Uh, if you wanna uh, see this in, uh, in action, go follow this uh, Twitter account, um, which is Italian Comments, so the name is Italian Smatted Food. Um, I would really, uh, I want to show you a few of them. They take screenshots of Italian people being angry. It's okay, we don't even, uh, we don't, they're like the varying degrees. It's funny, we don't even know how to joke on your English food since it's already a joke, okay. Uh, this one is, so I'm going to Naples this Friday and I only have one question. Will I be killed if I order pineapple on pizza? I hope so. <laughs> <coughs> uh, they, they have swearing, I, I, don't, I don't think I can say this. Uh, um, so if it's not a pizza, don't call it a pizza. They're very angry. Um, it looks like I'm taking food too seriously, but in reality, it's you not taking it seriously enough. Um, last one. Uh, how the hell can you even think about carbonara in a jar? How do you even think it could taste like carbonara? This is the biggest human disgrace ever. <laughs> so now you know this. Okay. Uh, so go follow this. This is amazing. This is what uh, Italy is about. Um, I work at a company called Apple. Um, I am an engineer there and I work in the environmental uh, supply chain innovation uh, organization. So I work in a small remote team with people all over the world and uh, we build, build the tools, internal tools with Elixir um, to support Apple's 2030 goal of having uh, all, all products be carbon neutral. Um, there's a, lot, a few other teams working with Elixir at Apple but this, this, is, this is where I work. Um, I've been a member of the Elixir team for, for about six years um, and I started with Elixir only a couple of years before that, uh, around 2014. So, um, and this is my story with Elixir basically. Um, so I like Elixir because it works like my brain. So let, let me elaborate. Um, during university and just out of university, uh, I started to, to get into programming languages. I really liked programming and I started to get into different programming languages and to explore many of them. Uh, they didn't click. So the first one I started with was uh, Fortran because I was a physics student um, and then I quickly moved on to C uh, and in, in C where I had to deal with you know, memory and pointers and, and allocation and integers of the wrong size and like solo level you know uh, and too much responsibility for me because I, I felt that the level of abstraction of the programming language was, was barely there. Um, so I was programming the computer in a language that the computer understood uh, too much better than me. You know, the computer was too good at understanding this, I was not. Um, and then so I started to move kind of like up the levels of abstractions from here um, and I quickly moved to exploring Java and Python. Um, so there are steps in the right direction from C, I guess, but uh, especially with Python, because um, now data structures were more intuitive, code was easier to read and like things were generally simpler. Uh, however, objects, you know, what, what is an object? Uh, I'm, I'm still not quite sure I know, uh, it's just, I think an abstraction that, that does abstract away in the right direction compared to, um, uh, to C, you know, uh, but uh, it's, it's an abstraction that for something that the computer understands, which is uh, memory, right? Like an object is essentially an abstraction over 
memory uh, that has some behavior, but that, that's what an object is, a piece of memory, right? Um, and the object takes care of maintaining some memory and allocating it and deallocating it for you usually, uh, but I just, I don't think in memory. I don't, when I program the computer, I don't think, oh, this, is, this is thing is here in this part of the memory doing some stuff. It doesn't really click with my brain, right? Uh, and after uh, Java and Python, uh, I moved to Ruby, um, which is kind of a sideways move a little bit. Uh, I love the community, I, I liked the language, I felt kind of empowered with the flexibility um, of uh, and metaprogramming and the magic there. Um, and I all came, I came to regret a lot of that because the magic, uh, this is a lot in Ruby. Um, and uh, Ruby is kind of where I got my, my, my first paid job, right? And I was building a sports magazine website in Rails, um, which went very well initially, but then it started to feel more like a, you know, like a sidestep from Python, uh, you know, because I was still dealing with, with objects and with mutable states and with essentially memory and like things that like were making it harder to think, for me to think about programming and computer classes, objects, in inheritance, they're not really things that click with my brain, right? Um, so I keep wandering around. Um, I try Haskell, for example. I try some uh, some versions of Lisp just to try things out. Um, too complex, like Haskell is definitely too complex for, for young me. I'm not sure I would, I would be fine with it now, but, um, and then, uh, I get Elixir, uh, so I get this <laughs> beautiful, be beautiful language. This was around 2014, and if you were doing Ruby in 2014, you'd have to be really off in, in like some corner uh, doing stuff in order to not hear about Elixir, because Ruby in 2014 was more about Elixir than Ruby, it felt sometimes. Uh, so I take a look at this Elixir, I buy the, the Dave Thomas' uh, programming Elixir book, and I got just hooked. You know, I start to contribute to Elixir's documentation, um, which is what Elaine actually mentioned in, in, in the Q&A. So that's how I started in Elixir, just contributing to, uh, to documentation. Uh, I felt in love with the language and with the community. I really felt at home. So eight years later, this has never been more true. Um, I owe so much to this language, I don't even know uh, where to start from. So uh, for example, this is my first tattoo ever. Uh, if you can see it, it's a, it's a Elixir drop. Um, as important as the tattoo, I also met my wife through Elixir. Um, because uh, I spoke at a bunch of conferences and she invited me uh, to a conference and uh, three years later we are married. So thanks to Elixir, uh, <laughs> really. Um, so uh, why do I like Elixir so much? Because uh, when I found it, I finally found a programming language that works uh, like my brain, right? So the abstractions make sense, the tools make sense. Um, I can think what I want the computer to do and then the that thought is close to how I actually would write it in Elixir, right? And for me, that's, that's everything. It makes programming just, uh, it takes away the, the hard part of programming because I can think about the problem that I'm solving instead of the tools and how to solve it in those tools, right? Um, and Elixir doesn't work just like my brain. I think also Elixir works kind of like people. Um, and I will go into this analogy and, and let, let me just like take you through um, this analogy. Um, so I really like Elixir and Erlang because they, they also kind of work like the world. Uh, works, like the real world works. So the abstraction in these languages match really well with something we know a lot about, which is people and how people interact. All right, so let me take you through, through this analogy. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is processes. Um, so let's start with processes now, I think about, about Elixir and Erlang uh, processes and why I think they work with, like people in, in some ways. Um, so the first part of the analogy is process, a process is a person. So um, that's, that's the analogy really, right? Like a, in, I, I think of a process as uh, I think of a person. So what, first up, the person can only do one thing at a time, right? Uh, multitasking, yes, but you're really one conscious cognitive task at once. We can do one thing at a time, one step at a time. And that's exactly like processes, right? In Erlang and Elixir, code in each process executes one instruction at a time, right? A single process cannot be doing more than one thing at once, it's just one, uh, one step after one step. Uh, so one similarity, down. Um, concurrency, so each person works sequentially, they work one step at a time, okay, but people work concurrently with each other, right? This is the same as processes, of course. So now I'm, I'm here speaking on stage, uh, someone's listening, someone might be sleeping, uh, who knows? But like we're all doing different stuff concurrently, right? Um, and uh, processes is the same for processes. Processes do things sequentially in their own little world, uh, but they do things concurrently across each other, right? They're doing things at the same time across different processes. So another, another similarity here. Um, then let's talk about memory. So uh, people have brains and they have thoughts, 
right? And there's memory inside those brains. Uh, can they share them with anybody? Not really, right? The, the, the technology is not there yet to communicate brain to brain, right? So let's just, no, we can't share thoughts. Um, and that is kind of like, or, or memory, right? And that is kind of like the memory of processes. So a process does not share any of its memory with other processes. Um, other processes don't really know what the process is or, or, or what are its, uh, its memories, you know? Um, so which are the allocated memory of the process, right? So two processes can't really know that about each other. Uh, like two people can't really know about what's inside the brain of each other, right? Um, also another, oi, oi, I pressed too much. Okay, um, and then, uh, one more thing about this, about memory, memories and thoughts, is that they are kind of immutable, aren't they? Like our, our memory and our thoughts. Because once you have a memory, that memory can't really change, you know? Like, bear with me, because I, I know it can change, like memories change, but on principle it shouldn't change, right? Because it's a memory about something that happened, so it shouldn't really change, right? And thoughts are immutable too, like you have thoughts, and then you have other thoughts, but you can't really change a thought that you had. You can only add more thoughts on top of it, right? Um, and all of this uh, works kind of like memory for processes, right? So process memory is immutable, and the data in the process cannot be changed. Um, the process can only create new data that references existing data, right? But never change existing data. This is, uh, in Elixir and Erlang, we have this very strong immutable data um, kind of system and, uh, and uh, data structure architecture where you can't change data, you can't go right into memory uh, where something already was. You can only all allocate new memory. You can reference existing memory, but you can only allocate a uh, new one. You can't change existing memory. So, which is kind of like, like us. You can, only re you can reference previous memories, but you can't really change them, or you can't uh, you know, change a thought that you already had. Um, so I think that we got the analogy of process to person. Like, it's, it's, it's pretty good, I think. Um, so on to the interaction side of things now. Um, and generally the communication, right? Let's talk a bit about communication. Um, so how do humans share information? If I have a thought or if I have a memory, how do I copy it to, to someone else's brain? Speaking, right? Uh, so writing, rather forms of communication. But in, in all cases, I have to communicate, right? I can connect to someone else's brain just and dump the information in the brain. Right? I also can't get them um, direct access to my brain by plugging something in my brain. I need to communicate information, information right? which is what I'm doing now. And talking is kind of just a way to, to copy information over to someone else, right? So communicating information creates copies of that information. Um, it's imperfect in the real world, of course, because like what I communicate does not necessarily what gets copied uh, into other people's brains, but let's pretend it's, 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 it's perfect and then, and then this analogy really works. Um, so when I talk to someone, I'm really copying information from my head to their head, right? Which is, which is amazing, like it's exactly what I'm doing now, right? Like I'm, I'm here, I'm copying the information that is in my brain, but I have to say it out loud in order for you to, to copy it in your brains, right? Um, and you might see where I'm going with this, with processes, right? Because how do processes communicate? How do they share information? Message passing, right? Exactly, so this is exactly how the processes share information. If a process A wants to get a piece of data, a piece of information from process A to process B, the only way that it can do that is to send process B a message. And what does sending a message do? Um, sending a message from one process to another copies that message from the memory of the sender process to the memory of the destination process, right? So it's, exa it's, it's exactly the same. We have, well, the only way we have is to send things around. Um, and if we want to push this analogy even a little bit more, we can talk about the fact that speaking is kind of synchronous and listening is kind of asynchronous, right? So the way that speaking and listening work um, it's kind of like another similarity with sending and receiving message because in Elixir, um, as you may know, sending a message is an asynchronous operation, right? When you send them, the process that sends a message doesn't really know that the message gets delivered on the other end or like it gets processed on the other end, right, by the other process. It doesn't know when it reaches the destination. It's guaranteed to eventually reach it by the beam, but it's not guaranteed that it's going to be processed or that it's going to be processed within a certain time frame. You just don't know. So you just send the message kind of into the void, right? And in fact, the send, the send uh, call that we have in Elixir, uh, it just returns right away. It sends the message and returns right away, right? Um, and this is kind of like speaking or writing, right? When I speak, I have no way of knowing whether the listener is listening or especially processing the information 
that I'm sharing, right? I, I need them to acknowledge this information. Um, and this is exactly what you need to do in Elixir as well. When you send a message and you want to know that uh, the message got received and processed, um, you have to send an acknowledgement message back from the destination process, right? You have the destination process um, receive the message, process it, and then sends an send an acknowledgement back. And from the original process, you have to wait for that acknowledgement, and then you know that the interaction is complete, right? That the request response cycle is complete, which is the way that we kind of speak, right? I speak to someone, and then I kind of wait for them to do like this, you know, or, or to say yeah, uh, and then and then I know that they understood, you know. So I, I I speak, and then I'm waiting for them to do this, and this is like my speaking is is asynchronous because I have them to wait for them. It's not exactly like this, but uh, bear with me with the analogy, right? Um, and when it comes to messaging, as I said, kind of listening is kind of um, uh, kind of blocking, right? Kind of uh, synchronous. Because um, can I listen to someone if they're not speaking? Not really, right? I have to like sit and wait for them to speak um, in order to listen. So it's, it's blocking. And it's the same way when receiving messages. If you ever use the receive primitive in Elixir, um, it's, uh, it's exact doing exactly that. It's waiting for a message to come. It's blocking until a message comes. Um, it's quite more nuanced than that because uh, um, there's pattern matching and there's timeouts uh, if you've used it uh, and there's the process mailbox and like all these like rules that are kind of like specific to programming uh, of course because it's not people speaking it's still a computer but at the heart of it receiving is a blocking operation right and it's so in the same way as uh, as uh, speaking is so uh, more into the analogy no this is uh, this this was this was the analogy. My analogy ends here, but I've always loved this way of thinking about uh, processes and process interactions. Um, and if you worked with Elixir, I would really love to hear your thoughts because I'm curious to hear, you know, if anybody else th thinks this way, you know. And I don't think this is an original idea uh, that I had. Um, I, I really can't recall, but I think I might have uh, read about this in Programming Erlang by uh, Joe Armstrong. Um, so I think he might have written about that there, but I'm not sure. Did anybody ever like listen to this analogy? Yeah, so okay, so th that's good. Uh, now I copied the information on uh, onto your brains and uh, and so you you know this as well. Um, and to me it always made a lot of sense. I really like to think about this uh, and it makes me write a Luxor code that I feel uh, like it's more, uh, it's easier to reason about when I think about it this way, that's all. Um, but this analogy is not the only thing that makes sense. Uh, so as I said initially, so Elixir work, in, in my opinion, it kind of like this process stuff works like people, but um, Elixir also works like my brain in, in other ways, let's say, right? So there's other things that make sense in the way that I write Elixir um, that, that kind of like they fit into my mental model of programming, right? Um, so the analogy is over, but these are other ways that I that I want to get into how it all makes sense to me, right? And one of them is links. Uh, so process links. Um, who's ever used the process link directly? Very few people. Right? Okay. Uh, who's ever used genserver.start link? Okay, so more like a lot more, yeah. So um, links is how processes can essentially connect to each other, right? Um, and uh, in general, knowing when uh, a process is alive or dies is a, is a very fundamental primitive to build resilient and reactive systems. You want processes to know about each other's lives. Um, and links are a general way to implement something like that. Because uh, a link, links to processes bidirectionally can be set up from either of those processes and if one of the process exits the other process exits too that's the whole deal so if one process dies the the other linked pro all the linked processes die as well um, and you can imagine when situations where this is a desirable behavior because it, ca it can express dependency between processes right maybe you have a process that's holding some state and then you have other processes that ask this process for that state by, by doing request response cycles. Um, and you want this process to um, kind of like other processes to depend on this process. So if this process dies or goes down, maybe you want the other process to go down too because they don't really function without it, right? So link can express this. Um, and as I said, it's just a matter of calling process.link from a process to another process. If you use the gen server the start link, that is exactly um, what start link is doing. That's if you uh, go look through the, it's kind of, I think it's ingrained in our brains a lot to use something like genserver.startlink, but genserver also has genserver.start, uh, which doesn't link 
for example, right? Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the deal uh, with the, the, the difference between start and start link. And usually you use start link because the process that's starting a gen server usually wants to link itself to the gen server especially. So usually you do that because you want the calling process to bring the gen server down in case it dies, right? Because you don't want to leave. If you use gen server to start, what happens if the gen server goes down? What happens to your process? Nothing, right? Uh, your process is fine. But if you use genserver.start link, what happens if your process, your process, if you use genserver.start, sorry, what happens if your process, the calling process dies? What happens to the gen server? It's a zombie process, basically, right? Like you could have a, like that's an easy way to get yourself a memory leak if you have this process going around that doesn't get cleaned up by anything, right? If you use start link, you kind of solve both things. Like uh, what you, the, the process that starts the gen server now can bring the gen server down if it goes down and so that everything gets cleaned up. So that's the idea behind links. And uh, the nice thing is that with links um, you and message passing and processes, you have all of the primitives to implement a lot of the abstraction, most of the abstractions that are in the Beam and in OTP. So links make a lot of sense to me because of this. Um, they do have one feature that is uh, a little bit weird, which is trapping exits. Um, but uh, um, sorry, yes. Uh, so they have a, they have a, a, a feature that's a bit weird to me, which is which is trapping exits. Um, and the way that trapping has anybody ever used trap exits? Very few people. So uh, then allow me to explain just one second. So the, 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 what trapping exit does is that if a process sets this flag, you have this call called process.flag, and you can set trap exits to true. And if you do that, um, you essentially the process is, if a process that you, your process that now trap exits is linked to, uh, the process doesn't die. It only receives a message. So imagine that you have process A, process B, and then they are linked, and process A traps exits. Then if process B dies, the beam will send a message to process A. Uh, it's a message that's like a, a tuple with a big uh, uppercase exit atom first and then the PID and the reason. Um, but the idea is that you, you get notified instead of going down uh, yourself, right? So it's not the, like, it's an abstraction that's a little bit weird. It's the fact that you have the links that bring down both processes bi-directionally, but then you have uh, trapping exits so that you can kind of get out of this uh, this situation where your process dies. But this abstraction makes sense when you put it in context because with this you can really um, build all of the abstractions in OTP. The, all of the abstractions that we have in OTP or like 95% you can build with just message passing links and trapping exits. And if you remember what I just said with the gen server, if you call gen server start link Usually you want the gen server to die if the caller dies, so that's okay. But a lot of time, you, maybe you don't want your process to die if the gen server dies, right? Because you want your process to be kind of the parent of the process. Maybe you wanna know that the, process, that the gen server died, but you don't really wanna your process to die too, right? And that's a case where you would set your process up to trap exits, and then you would start the gen server, right? That way you, you're kind of waiting for, um, uh, you, 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 you're you going to know if the gen server dies without really um, bringing your process down as well. So this makes a lot of sense. And with this abstraction, you can build most of OTP. So for example, gen servers, what, what, what's a gen server? It's a process that is just handling requests and serving responses, right? That's what you call the server. And uh, it's listening for request messages, basically. It's processing them and sending response messages back. And that gen server module, module essentially includes a collection of functions and callbacks um, that hide the message passing on both sides, right? Uh, so the caller and the gen server just exchange messages following a specific message API or a specific protocol, that, that's what's in the gen server module. Um, but all of this is only done through message passing. So when a process sends a gen server a request, uh, what it's doing is the process sends a message to the gen server. The gen server has what, what was called the receive loop, but it's essentially a big receive, just waiting for messages, then doing some stuff, and then going back into the receive the next time. So just waiting for the next message. That, uh, that is a, the, a receive loop, a message receive loop. So that when you're doing a gen server call, it's just the call with process sends a message to the gen server, and then goes into a receive, waiting for the response, which is what I was talking about earlier, right? It's, a, it's a, the interaction where I say something, 
and then the other person is listening, and then I wait for an acknowledgement that, that uh, what I said I made it to the other person, right? This is what it, how it works. Process calls, gen server uh, dot call, sends a message to the gen server, and then goes into a receive loop. The gen server goes, the, does the opposite, essentially. It's waiting in a, in a receive loop, gets the message, produces a response, and sends a response back to the process, right? And this is all done through uh, send and receive. It's not done through, like, you don't need any other primitives to do this. Uh, you, you do need the, the, usually you do need the, the timeouts in the receive to make this not blocking forever, but those are the primitives that you need. If you y introduce links and the trapping exits, then you can build supervisors as well with processes, message passing, message sending, receiving, and, and links and, uh, um, and trapping exits, right? Because a uh, supervisor, what is a supervisor? It's a process that spawns other processes, you know, it's children, uh, links to them, and then traps exits. That's pretty much what it's doing. Um, so this way, it kind of builds that tree aspect of the supervisor, because a supervisor, who's ever used a supervisor directly, by the way? I right, okay, a lot of people. Who said, had the children equals uh, open bracket in their application.ex file? Everyone, yeah, no, if you don't, you're, you're, you're lying. Everybody, everybody has this, because it's just what Phoenix generates, for example, when you do uh, a new Phoenix application. But so, so the supervisor is kind of usually the root of the application is, is a supervisor, right? And, and the way that, super, that you get this aspect of a child that crashes and it's restarted, but then eventually propagates, it propagates, it propagates, this is, uh, th this, this is done with, um, links and trapping exits, right? So supervisor is a process that spawns children, um, it links to them and then traps exits. And this way, if the supervisor crashes, it propagates down, right? Because the processes are linked to the supervisor. So it, it propagates down uh, and it kills the children, brings down the children. Um, if a child crashes though, uh, the supervisor is just notified with an exit message because the supervisor traps exit, right? So the supervisor is notified um, with this exit message um, and uh, su supervisor, and then it can restart the process. That's the whole point. So essentially, the supervisor is a l also a loop that just spawns a child, and then it just spawns children, and then it just listens to exit messages. And if if a child sends an exit message, um, the supervisor maps the child to the the, the child specification that you provided to restart it, and just restarts it, and links again, and then all over again. Um, and then at some point, the supervisor will say, "Okay, I give up." This is enough, it shuts down because there's too many restarts, for example, and it shuts down and it brings down all other children because all of them are linked to it. And then the parent supervisor of that supervisor gets an exit message, right? So supervisors sprinkle a bunch more logic on top of this by, because they keep state, they have more graceful process shutdown, um, they have uh, more they, they don't really do abrupt, abrupt ca crashes like I just described. It's not like if a supervisor sees a child crashing too much, it just dies and brings everything down in chaos. It actually tries to, to, to terminate children's children gracefully. Um, but the principle is uh, it's this. It's still based on um, all the logic you need. It doesn't do anything using any fancier primitives than just process linking, dropping access, and message passing, right? Um, also, if we have, uh, do we have people new to Elixir here? We do have people new to Elixir. How uh, freaky is that I said the word kill children, terminate children, <laughs> kill parent, uh, like crash children so many times, it's amazing. It gets you to talk about stuff that you usually can't talk about. So <laughs> um, so uh, with with the, these abstractions, I, uh, they make sense to me, the, the, the message passing and the process and the links and dropping axes, they all make sense to me because they let me build pretty intuitively, in the way that my, my brain works at least, it, it, it lets me build something like this pretty intuitively. Like I would be able to, I've never really like to look too much at the supervisor code in Erlang, for example, but I'm confident that I could build something terrible that kind of works like this by myself, just using these primitives. And I'm confident that like most of you could as well, right? Uh, because the, the primitives are there and if you understand sending and receiving messages, and if you understand links, then this is not that hard to build. Then it's obviously, it's very hard to build it to the way it's built now, and it's, you know, that where it doesn't really have bugs. Uh, or, for example, it's like it has all, all these options to control the life cycle of things. Um, but this is pretty, pretty intuitive once you know these primitives, right? Even more is the gen server. The gen server is 
you can implement this as a process yourself. And it's a really good exercise if you want to learn more about message passing is implement the gen server module by yourself. And it's not, it's not very hard once you understand the primitives between, um, between processes and sending and receiving messages, right? Um, so Elixir has all these abstractions that make a lot of sense to me. Do any of these abstractions leak? Like, are, are any of these abstractions kind of bad? Um, so they work in a way that my mind clicks with. You know, I can reason about the messages, and I can reason about links, and immutable data, um, and all of that. And I don't really have to think about memory or objects or classes or things that are very abstract. Like a process for me, just like a sort of little robot doing its own thing, right? And the little robots can talk to each other, and it kind of makes sense. A class, I don't know what's a class. So there you go. Um, so in, 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 in this perfect world that Elixir creates for me, that do any of, of its abstractions don't make sense? Or like, you know, is it, is it, is it just like, is it, is it too good? Um, I think that some of them are kind of harder to reason about. Um, some of them I are good. Like they don't fit in, this, in these abstractions in a good way. Um, so for example, a, a really good thing about, I like about Elixir is, is that it's very pragmatic. So for example, I, I did this all you know, preaching about, oh, immutable data, it's amazing, you can't go change the memory of this and that, uh, but then you have ETS tables, right? So, it's, you, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you have this escape hatches, you know, that, because uh, if you need to escape the immutable data paradigm and do something pragmatic, Erlang and Elixir, they let you do that, right? Um, so it's still kind of on brand with the paradigm of Erlang and Elixir, because you're, you're not going to get a pointer to memory, for example, that you just don't get. You know, yeah, you have NIFs, but let's like pretend that the NIFs are not there because they're they're hard to use and not very commonly used. But the language itself doesn't really give you a way to point at memory, so it's still very much in the Elixir universe. But um, it, it gives you like you are, you have good pragmatic alternative alternatives for doing things, right? Um, so you have ETS tables, as I mentioned. Like if you want to deal with some shared memory between processes and you don't want to do message passing, you're going to use ETS tables and ETS tables. A testament to how common that is is that they are used a lot. You know, like uh, they're used in Elixir. Um, they're using like there's there's databases built on it, built built on them. There's uh, the Elixir compiler uses them a lot. For example, um, they're used to build caches. Like you can use them for a lot of things because it's a common problem. Like you wanna, yeah, you wanna live in this perfect world where everything gets gets to uh, be passed around, but also you wanna um, you wanna live in a world where things are not slow as hell, right? Um, but when I said that things are on brand, for example, like ETS tables, they're still, they're still um, sequential, the ETS table itself, right? Like you can read data concurrently, you can write data concurrently, but in the ETS table, two things can happen at the same time. Like a piece of data is only going to be manipulated by two operations. Uh, in, like if you do an update or an increment on an ETS table, the data is incremented atomically, right? So you, you still have all of these tools that you kind of used to to work with data and not have like corrupt memory, like you can corrupt memory in an ETS table, right? So uh, that which you definitely can corrupt the memory if you have the pointer to the memory, you know, pretty easy. Um, so you have this stuff. You have also things like ports or like IO. Those are very practical because uh, in functional programming languages, a lot of the time you have these things are like, oh, everything is pure. Everything is uh, is immutable. Then how do you do I.O., right? Because uh, Allah was saying it earlier, if you get to today's date, that's already impure, right? Because it's going to change. Uh, but Elixir has no issues with giving you today's date at all, you know? Uh, and that's, I think that's just pragmatic. That makes sense to me. So it kind of goes out outside of this, some of the abstractions that, it, that Elixir has and that the Erlang has, but it, it makes sense to me, you know? Like it, it's very pragmatic and it makes you I think it makes writing Elixir code a lot easier, you know. Um, and another thing that is hard for me to uh, think about, but which kind of makes sense, is uh, the hardest thing is, in my opinion, is concurrency. You know, so we talked about all these beautiful abstractions and people and processes uh, talking to each other. Um, so th this analogy of people and processes makes a lot of sense to me, but concurrency is hard, still very hard to reason about. And this is true in the real world too, you know, uh, I think, because in, in the process and people analogy as well, because if it's, it's hard to kind of clearly imagine large organizations of people doing things, for example, right? Um, because there's a lot of individual pieces, a lot of individual 
people moving at the same time and doing things at the same time, right? So we can reason about single individuals, for example, you know, like what, what, what anybody's doing at any given time. You can think about it, one person. You can think about small groups, maybe, right? Because you can see the interactions between the groups. But our, I don't think our brain just works with number bigger than like five or something, you know? Like, just, like we just can't fathom having like, you know, like a hundred people, you can't like have all the, the, the understand all the, the, the communication and the, and the social graph and everything when you go to larger numbers, right? Um, it really goes hard, get, get, gets, gets harder and harder uh, uh, when the numbers go up to, to, to think about these things, right? And it's kind of the same thing with processes, I think. And when you have a big system with a lot of processes talking to each other, it can be really hard, especially if processes are doing different things, right? Like it's a little bit easier when you have a thousand uh, cowboy handlers, you know, in Phoenix that are, that are handling TCP or like HTTP requests because they're all doing the same things. But when it's different processes doing different stuff, it's really hard to think about, right? And I think it's like the real world, you know? So uh, it's, it doesn't really escape the analogy. It's just that it, it's, for me, it's hard. Um, and I don't think it's hard because the language make it, makes it hard. I think it's just a hard thing for a human brain to think about, or at least my human brain. Um, and Elixir itself just honestly gives you all the tools to make the best uh, of concurrency, you know, and to create the best concurrent pro programs that you can, in my opinion. And it, it has really rock solid primitives um, that, that I talked about. It has a really good um, ways to debug these things and to trace the messages, you know, and to see the processes. And you have the um, uh, the debugger with uh, with the, the the observer, you know, with all the you can build like these uh, supervision trees and visualize them, and you can trace the messages going around, and you can see if oh if I kill this one with the mouse, what happens, and you see the other ones being recreated. Sure, doesn't help me when you have like a lot of things going on at once, you know, a lot of different things going on. It's really hard to um, to reason about. The fact that processes are sequential and the memory is immutable, I think it's uh, one of the foundations of this because if you didn't have that, then it would be, for me, impossible to think about this because if another process can change the memory of another, like uh, if a process can change the memory of another process, then I'm, I'm completely lost because I don't know at any point, like if the, the fact that a single process has to change things inside its, pro its, its, its own little world, that helps a lot. But when you have many processes interacting, it's still hard, um, which is just a hard problem in my opinion. Um, so it, to kind of con conclude and s start the conclusion, uh, I tried to keep it short so that we 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 can we can go home earlier since we had a few uh, a few hiccups. But uh, I'll, I'll have a lot of time for questions at least. Um, so this was my story with Elixir. I would love to hear your story with Elixir. I would love to hear your analogies and like what you think about. Um, about this, what you think about this analogy, if you have any other, you know, sort of ways you think about uh, these things. Um, to talk about, kind of wrap up about Elixir itself and, and, and the love I have for this language. Um, so it seems like right now Elixir is, is in kind of a weird spot because it doesn't really have a huge community, right? Like if, I bet that like, I don't know, but I bet that if you organize a JavaScript conference in Montevideo, there's gonna be more people than uh, in an Elixir conference. I hope not, I mean, but uh, like that's, that's true in a lot of places at least. Uh, so we don't, we don't have a huge community like, you know, like Ruby or JavaScript or Go. Um, and we don't have big corporations behind Elixir, right? Like Go has Google or Raster as Mozilla. Um, and we don't really have that for Elixir yet. Um, we have a lot of big companies using Elixir, but nobody's kind of taking care of uh, like maintaining Elixir itself, right? Um, and they're not, there's just not that many people using Elixir compared to, like in our, I see that in our little world and in our, in my bubble of Elixir, everybody's using Elixir, you know, because I live in this world, but, uh, but if you take a step outside, then you mention Elixir to someone that, that like some programmer does like a, a good chance that they never heard of it, you know, like it's not, it's still a niche language in, in some ways, right? Um, however, my experience is that there are not a lot of people that leave Elixir once they come across it. So I've, I have very, very rarely met people that use Elixir and then they were like, ah, then I switch back to this or that, unless it was for like, you know, work reasons, like they, they had to get a job and they, they, they didn't find any Elixir jobs, right? So it's very, very few people leave, it seems like, you know? And it seems to me like the, the Elixir has that, that, uh, that thing, you know, the je, je ne sais quoi, you know, that uh, it has something that makes people fall in love. And I can see this in the talks at conferences, when I read things online, when I talk to people, it just, 
there's this magic combination of ingredients that seems to make people fall in love and make people stick around, right? So some people stay for, for OTP and the Beam, uh, some people stay for the resiliency, some people stay for, for because they love functional programming, or they love the syntax, or they love the macro system, they just, you know, there's just this combination of things that sort of like, they like a few of them, and you know, they, they just, it just seems to capture people. And you can see this, as I mentioned in the Q&A, you can see this in the fact that Elixir is being brought to fields that just are like way outside of what was being built with Elixir like five years ago, you know? Like Elixir started as this, Erlang actually started as uh, telecommunications, right? It's perfect to build like networks of, of, phone, of telephone switches and routers and stuff like that. It's great, but it kind of stayed in there, right? And then Elixir apparently kind of found something that brought Erlang a little bit to a wider audience. Like maybe Erlang just didn't didn't have that. Uh, it could be the syntax. It could be like I don't know a smaller community or something. But Elixir kind of br br broke that barrier, and now we have we see Elixir. Okay, Elixir in nerds, like in embedded devices, and then you see Elixir in numerical computing, like that's that's crazy to me, like in numerical computing, because there's, there's a lot of stuff that does numerical computing already. We, we don't need Elixir there, you know? But the fact that Elixir is being brought there is amazing, because like it, it tells me a story that people really love this language, so much so that they want to kind of bend it and you know, make it go to, to, the, to, to numerical computing, right? Which is great. Um, and so we have all this stuff that makes people fall in love and maybe, maybe we are going to have types. And if we have types, like who's going to stop us? You know, like they're going to want to build everything in Elixir because the only thing that I can hear about, yeah, but it doesn't have types. So well, if it has types, then like it's, you know, we're, we're all screwed. Like we're all going to use Elixir. Uh, so that was all. I hope uh, that uh, some of you that, uh, that are here today will be that, that people that kind of come across Elixir and they're new to Elixir. Uh, and never leave, hopefully. Uh, and the more we are, the more thing we can, uh, things we can achieve, you know. And um, I hope you saw that this was kind of my love letter to Elixir, and I hope you'll get to feel the same one day if you don't feel that already. And thank you so much for having me. Questions? It's okay. Preguntas? It's not It's not a question, but I wanted to say that I feel the same way in the in the sense that sometimes some programming languages feel like they're putting roadblocks between me and what I want to do, mm -hmm. and Elixir is not like that. It's like quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's like it's helping me achieve the goal that I want. Do you feel the same way? Definitely, yeah, that's definitely what, so the, the, the whole part about pragmatism for me was exactly that, like if I, if I look at Haskell, it's, it's really beautiful, like there's all this like math uh, concept behind it, and math is amazing, right? everything works, everything's just clean, but then like what do I use a programming language for? I don't use it to like write recursive functions on lists, you know, I write it, I use it to like print something on the, like send some data on the web, and if I have to like use like concepts that I will not understand at all just to do something like send data over the web, then for me it's really hard to use this as a tool, right? I want to, I, like, I want to do things that I like. This is a, it feels like Elixir is a pro programming language built as nicely as you can, f but for real people, like, that want to do real stuff at the end of the day, you know? And, and uh, so, so to me, yeah, definitely, this is, uh, like, I don't, I, when I use Elixir, I rarely feel like, oh, I have roadblocks in, in what I want to do. There's still some things that Elixir doesn't do good. And one of them, for example, is, and now I'm going to say it, and in three years I'm going to stand here and I'm going to say, like, they even brought it in the, to, to CLIs, for example, right? Like Elixir is terrible at CLIs because it's just, like, you need to start the beam to, to, to start Elixir. So, like, I don't want to have, like, a LS replacement written in Elixir, right? Because I don't want to type LS and wait, like, three seconds for the beam to start, right? So there are still things that I don't want to do with Elixir, but for the things where I can feed it, like it's really like I never feel, as you said, I never feel like it's it's putting things in my way and you know putting obstacles in my way. So, Otra preguntas. Bye. Um, in the spirit of uh, loving letters to Elixir, yes. Um, I think what made me stay was the community and seeing people like you and Todd here. Uh, in Lao, who contribute and maintain libraries and uh, the language itself, 
and seeing like the job of Whiteworks uh, is doing here. Uh, and all of those people in the community, such a warm crowd, I think um, more than the beam itself, I think that's what keeps us here. And um, we we don't have a BDFL, like a, a BDF, for those who don't know, like uh, Jose is not the one dictating everything and we uh, just follow his orders. Uh, I think at some point, sometimes uh, during discussions about the languages, uh, he leave his opinions behind and accepts what the community wants. And I think that's, um, that's amazing. Uh, you don't see that in um, too many languages, and especially in a language that's not backed by a big company. So thank you, thank you Todd, thank you Lau, thank you Y work here. And um, just to uh, finish light, do you believe in supervisor? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna comment the first part first, which is that uh, so we don't have a benevolent dictator for life, and if I had, if we had, well, I couldn't say because because they would be angry at me. Um, so, but no, the community is really like a huge part of Elixir, I think, and uh, I kind of give it for granted a lot of the time because I was in in it for so long, and uh, you know, I never, I, I never quite. Uh, I think reflect about this too much, you know, I never think about this too much, but it's amazing, yeah. And and Jose is not a benevolent dictator for life, luckily, but he is benevolent, um, if that makes sense. So he, I think he uh, set up a community really, he used strength to set up positive things when needed, um, like in the best possible way. And and uh, I think that that's not nothing, you know, so. And yeah, the community is, is amazing. Uh, I, I, I truly agree with that. And I was trying to say that in kind of to, to this, this touches what I said in the Q&A about the fact that people just build things with Linux in a certain way that, 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 that you know, that thing that I, I like, you can't put your, hand, your, your finger on it, but the way that NX is being run, the people that run, the people that run NX, the people that run Phoenix, the people that like the, the Phoenix core team, the Hex core team, the Nerves core team, they're, they're all, fit in this community it's amazing you know they all believe they have they have the same core values you know of, of kindness and of inclusivity and like uh of welcoming newcomers and trying to make things tools that are good for people to use so uh, that's a huge part yes so uh, i mean thank you to everybody that contributes uh, for sure and uh, do i believe in supervisors they work they yes yes <laughs> i've used them i've seen them do their work i've had processes crash even sometimes and uh, supervisors have restarted them so Hi. I, are there also companies in Europe embracing or adopting uh, Elixir? Because I mostly hear about companies in the US doing it, but um, what's happening in Europe right now? What's happening in Europe right now? Um, yes, we have companies using Elixir. We have uh, quite a big, uh, qu quite a big number of smaller companies using Elixir. There's, I think, there's a lot of uh, um, consultancies, and uh, I, I, so the. The Elixir community in Europe is huge. Uh, so, suffice to say that like the, the Elixir core team is all Europeans in different countries. You know, like we, we have a lot of people working with Elixir. The Elixir conferences are huge in Europe. You know, like there's there's a there, there's a lot of them, and there there there's a lot of people in the UK doing Elixir. There's um, so there, definitely yes, uh, and there are companies. Uh, I don't know about big companies. The biggest one that comes to mind from Europe probably is Remote.com. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're a company that do like they hire you in Europe as an employee or anywhere in the world. I think um, they support a bunch of countries and they hire you and then they invoice the company so that you can work for U.S. companies essentially and be an employee in your country. Uh, they use Elixir. Um, there's a, uh, a yes. I mean, all, like yes. Is the answer yes. There's a there's a bunch of companies using Elixir in in Europe. Yes, definitely. I don't know. I know in the U.S. there's a lot of companies. I know in the like the community here in South America, is like in Brazil, it's pretty big. Um, but in Europe, it, the community is very big as well. There's a lot of also a lot of uh, research type stuff going on in uh, in Italy, which is uh, which is good. And the Erlang community is possibly bigger in uh, uh, in Europe, right? Because you have you have er uh, Ericsson, you know, and doing doing. Erlang itself, uh, and they're based kind of based in Europe, and you have a lot like WhatsApp, for example, has London offices doing 
um, are long as well. So the beam in general, there's a lot of people um, and, and a lot of the core team of, of Erlang is in, in Europe as well. And so, yes, I think so. You have also the conference, the Elixir conference. Europe is quite bigger. That's uh, huge. Yeah, we yeah, are a new contender, but yes, <laughs> no, but like Elixir Conf EU is 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 huge because it gets the I mean the, the the Europe right, and they'd also do Elixir London, uh, you know, and there's a there's a but there's a lot of code beam, the small smaller conferences around Europe, like the commu community. There's a lot of like meetups in every, you know, city with more than I don't know five hundred thousand people. There has a has a. Uh, Elixir meetup. So the Elixir community is big. I, I struggle more to think about companies because I've worked for US companies for the last many years, you know, so uh, I don't, I'm not in the job market as much in, in Europe, but uh, the, the community is very active and there's, there's companies hiring. That's it. That's it. Applause. Thank you. Thank you so much.